Legal advice. Once more, Prefumo seemed to be safe, but he had his solicitors fully briefed. All parties took legal advice at this point. Christine Keeler suggested that she be paid a sum of £5,000 in compensation if she did not publish her Sunday pictorial article. Prefumo's solicitor decided that matters were becoming serious. Well, everyone's after the Sunday pictorial article. Anyway, he consulted Mark Lippmann, QC, and then, with Littman and Prefumo, called an Attorney General, Sir John Hobson. Prefumo informed the Attorney General that he had considered the matter very carefully and that he was prepared to prosecute. <coughs> the, fo the following day, Keeler's solicitor telephoned Ward's solicitor, and in the course of conversation, he remarked, she would like to have five. Ward solicitor replied, Oh, I'm sure that we will be all right. I will let you know. On 6th of October, on, sorry, sorry, 6th of February, Ward wrote to Lord Astor asking for £500 loan, which was sent in gracious manner, which was sent in a gracious manner. The rest was apparently refused by her and allegedly went to pay Ward's various debts. So Ward had debts. On 8th of February, debt, have being in debt has major consequences, as you know myself, you know, wondering where the, of late, 95, and then again, the lottery crashed again, you know, they changed the numbers at Woolworths, you know, if you're in debt, you know, a lot of conditions affect your mind and your physical appearance, and, you know, your outlook on life, so this boy, man was in debt. On 8th of February, since the, so, we know this, no one knows Mr. Ward, he's a doctor, he suddenly introduces, he has been introduced to a woman, and all of a sudden, he's world war criminal, you know, world war, sorry, world criminal number one, you know what I mean? So before this, we know that he's Mr. Ward, he's got debts, and he, he's a doctor, and he hasn't, well, yes, he's a doctor, and he likes to party. But he has to party to see people, right? On eighth of so it's like a, it's like a nick in the market. He's probably seen, you know, go see rich and famous, see if they need a doctor. And also we know that he may be taking drugs because of his debts, most probably. Uh, anyway, on a, I don't know details about this man's life. You know what I mean about his? Because look, he's, he's educated, he's a doctor, he's taken the oath, he knows what to do. On, if you make a collective average assumption of the global doctors and see what they get up to, you know, you'd, you'd find out that the doctors aren't really, aren't really, you know, like this. Anyway, they, they, maybe this is being misled, hasn't he? On 8th of February, since these delicate negotiations appear to have broken down, the, she signed the proofs of her article Sunday pictorial, pictorial and went into hiding. Meanwhile, Prefumo had not been idle. Mark Chapman Walker, general manager of the News of the World, had telephoned the Prime Minister's parliamentary private secretary and told him of the rumours that Prefumo and Keeler about Prefumo and Keeler. Chapman Walker first informed the head of MI5 and then interviewed Prefumo. Once more, Prefumo denied any impropriety impropriety, and the following day, fourth of February, he repeated his denial to the Conservative Chief Whip. The Prime Minister was told of Prefumo's denial and then somebody, it seems, suggested issuing a D-notice to Fleet Street, requesting that no news involving Ivanov should be published as a matter of national security, which is, which is the best thing to do. Ward also was busy. He telephoned the assistant editor of the Sunday Pictorial. So these people, Sunday Pictorial paper people, they were around as well. They were after, after them like a paparazzi, weren't they? And mustering and uh, you know, and mustering all his charm, persuaded the newspaper that yeah, and that Keeler's story was at least partially untrue, and offered offered his own story in exchange. On 17th of March, six weeks later, this story appeared in the pictorial two days after the end of the trial of Johnny Edcombe. Desperately worried, we've made a conclusion there that he could have committed suicide because of the shame of it all. But I will continue. Despite, despite, we need to know about his family life, you know, or his, you know, how he is with his parents, or how he is with his sister, his daughter, if he has any parents, uh, sorry, so daughter, brothers, 
you know, his, his immediate family, you know, is he respected, was he respected, all of a sudden, you know, this happens and he needs to commit suicide because he doesn't want to go home and face his family. Anyway, desperately worried about what she might be asked in a trial of edge game, Keela set out to pull a man and a girl from a car for Spain. The trial of Edgecombe opened on 14th March, and Keeler's absence made the front pages of the newskeepers. Sorry, of the newspapers. The following day, when Edgecombe was found guilty of possessing an illegal firearm, some newspapers found typically unsubtle ways of airing what they knew of preferment Keeler's affair, but only by suggestion, not by telling the facts. Frigg realised that his moment had come for airing the entire affair on Parliament. After 11 p.m. Thursday, 21st March 1963, in a debate on press freedom, he said, The press has shown itself willing to wound but afraid to strike. That being the case, I rightly use the privilege of the House of Commons to ask the Home Secretary to go to the dispatch box. He knows that the rumour to which I refer relates to Miss Catherine Keeler and Miss Davis, and a shooting by a West Indian, and on behalf of the government, categorically deny the truth of these rumours. So there's a, in here, there's a shooting by a West Indian. You know, West Indians and some people like this, they carry guns, and when they kill somebody or shoot somebody, it's just, it's just messing around. You know what I mean? They just fire away. There's nothing more to it, because they don't really care. So they just, boom, there you go. So it's no, nothing political about this West Indian lad. Other speakers, too, took up the theme without naming Prefumo, and it was not until after 1.30 a.m. that a meeting could be held in the room of Chief Whip. Prefumo was there, dragged from his bed and groggy, groggy with the effects of a sleeping pill, as, he, as was his solicitor and various members of the government. Now, this sleeping pill was probably given by Ward. They spent two hours drafting a statement for Prefumo to make in the House of Commons. I don't know what else they were on. At 11.08 a.m. the following day, he made his personal statement to the House, acknowledging his acquaintance